Hello, good evening everyone. Lovely to see you tonight and uh, welcome to Muslim Women's Art and Festival MACFEST, uh, the famous five-year-old Muslim Arts and Culture Festival. So welcome everyone. I uh, hope you had a lovely start for the week and uh, lovely to see you all. Uh, tonight it's uh, an, int uh, an interesting and special night actually. Like this day, uh, uh, 21 years ago, I had my uh, first child to celebrate Women's uh, uh, International Week and to prove that we are amazing. We are just amazing uh, uh, human beings. Uh, tonight is going to be a, a very special, uh, we have a very special uh, guest uh, and uh, uh, she is uh, an amazing and successful person and um, uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Maryam Francois and uh, the reason uh, we thought she's just an amazing example to, to talk to and to know more about her on this, uh, on uh, uh, the International Women's uh, Week. So during this uh, meeting, we will uh, know about uh, Mariam. She will be telling us about what she's been doing uh, for the last, uh, well, couple of years and uh, the things that they offered uh, to work. Uh, I will start uh, have you uh, on this meeting and to be asked by just uh, to introduce yourself to, to us tonight, please. Sure, thank you so much, Manira. Um, yeah, so as you said, my name is Dr. Miriam Francois. I am a journalist uh, and documentary filmmaker. Um, yes, I wear a few different hats. Uh, would you uh, start telling us about your film Finding Aisha, please? Well, sure. So um, I've spent the last three years working on my documentary directorial debut, which is called Finding Aisha. Uh, it's the story of a grandfather searching for his missing granddaughter, only it's not just any grandfather, it's the father of uh, Semi Mimur, one of the main perpetrators of the 2015 terrorist attacks in Paris, and his granddaughter was missing in northern Syria. And so I spent three years with the family um, really tracking the their search for this proverbial needle in a haystack really this missing piece of their life that was somewhere in a in a war zone and whom they felt this deep responsibility for uh whilst also kind of tracking the work that as has been doing um so as the grandfather um to try and somehow um kind of do good where his son had done so much harm so he reached out for example to the families of victims of terrorism, including the father of one of the uh, victims of his son's attack, and they became close friends and wrote the book together. And we track the work that they do in society to essentially highlight that the consequences of terrorist attacks don't have to be the society falls into binaries, that there are other ways of moving forward together um, beyond some of the schisms that have been entertained, I think, through um, both certain political decisions and a certain level of media discourse around these issues. So, yeah, that's the film in a nutshell. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what happened about that terrorist attack or terrorism in general, uh, you know, Aisha, um, uh, finding Aisha, I mean, uh, such attacks do give Islam and Muslim uh, all around the world a bad name because this is not really what uh, Islam asks us to do or uh, to, to behave in this way. So I don't know about your uh, view on this. Uh, like, how can we give a better uh, image about uh, Islam and Muslim in, in the world? Through what I mean. I mean, I don't, I don't know that individual Muslims have to carry the immense moral burden of trying to remedy the harm that other people have done, supposedly in the name of our faith. You know, there are 
um, a large majority of Muslims who are just trying to be normal, everyday, law-abiding yeah. citizens. That's true. Don't know that we have to um, kind of uh, de de define how we live our lives as, as an attempt to, in some way, prove their behavior wrong. I think that just existing in a way that is aligned with your faith and obviously does not accept um, the sort of very black and white and very harsh worldview that some people have adopted isn't in and of itself a way of responding to that I sort of take the view um that you know just as um I'm I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing um but the the idea that kind of uh, racism can be a distraction you know you can end up spending your whole life trying to convince others of your humanity and I think that um that's true of Islamophobia as well and I actually think it's probably yeah. not advisable to preoccupy yourself so much with other people's perceptions of you. Absolutely staying in France I'm talking about women uh, do you uh, can you compare you know living in both countries can you compare or tell us if uh, uh, the women in France are in the UK, do they have like differences? Uh, are their challenges are of a, of a different levels? Um, can you comment on that, please? Um, I mean, I think that there are different challenges for Muslims wherever you live in the world. I guess the uh, specific challenge that Muslim women who wear a headscarf or who are identifiably Muslim in France tend to um, face is that obviously there are um, clearer legal restrictions on where and how you can wear a headscarf, you know, in you can't wear it um, in school, you can't wear it in certain um, public institutions, increasingly you can't wear it in sports at any high level. Um, and so there definitely is a sense that um, visibly Muslim women or women who wear headscarves in particular, uh, you know, I wore a headscarf for most of my adult life. And I can say that in public spaces in France, you definitely feel like you are um, not welcome and that you have to really struggle to assert your um, presence in a space um, and and there's a level of hostility that's much more open towards the headscarf in France than there is in the UK. Um, I think different countries offer different challenges. Um, well, sorry to interrupt, so is it lack of integration or is it purely racism <laughs> in France? Is it, is it, I mean, do the women there, Muslim women, do they try to integrate, you know, to try and mix with the community there, or they are just being uh, rejected, simply as that? Well, I, I kind of think that nothing is ever that simple. I think everything's probably somewhere between the two, depending on who you're speaking about. You know, we have the largest Muslim community in the world in France. And so there's a whole spectrum of Muslim women that you're referring to, <laughs> some um, who, who definitely, uh, you know, do their best to abide by the rules of the country, even if they don't necessarily agree with them, and others who kind of find some sort of mitigation in, in how they manage it. So they wear a headscarf, but maybe they take it off in certain spaces, they deal with it in different ways. And, and then there are people who shut themselves, you know, away in more closed communities because they feel that they can't live their faith um, openly uh, in France, which is also not untrue. <laughs> you know, it's very difficult yeah. to wear a headscarf to- Absolutely. So it's, it's kind of, not completely black and white. I think everyone's sort of trying to, um, I guess, negotiate their own space uh, according to their own ideas of where the, where I guess the um, compromises can and should be made. 
Mm, okay, brilliant. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Miriam, I, I know you've been uh, very busy and you work with lots of like famous names like Al Jazeera uh, English. It's very popular in, in our world and for lots of people who follow that, you work with Channel 4 documentary and we might just touch on, on, on the, the things that you've done with them. But most importantly, you have a podcast and uh, I don't, it's, uh, we need to talk about whiteness. So I don't know if you want to tell us more about it, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I started the podcast back in 2019 um, because of a frustration that I felt personally in the way that race is discussed in the public sphere. Um, I felt that so much of the conversations felt um, very binary, very simplistic, very... Um, uh, antagonistic um, and that actually my personal view was that there are better ways to talk about these issues um, and that actually sometimes you need a space where somebody can ask the questions maybe you're afraid to ask or um, explore issues that you feel like maybe you can't because of the climate currently and at the same time I felt that there was a gap that needed to be narrowed between um, you know a worldview that I feel privileged to have access to um, by virtue of different facets of my identity and the reality is that you know there are assumptions within structural whiteness that many people who never kind of step out of um, spheres that are predominantly defined by white norms ever really engage with or know about or are even aware of. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the podcast for me was an opportunity to kind of use a pop culture medium to take certain concepts that are usually left in the ivory tower and try and disseminate them in a way that hopefully feels at least semi-entertaining. Yeah, amazing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you've also done a documentary with uh, BBC Radio 4 about City of Refuge. Is that correct? Yeah, I've made a couple of documentaries with Radio 4. Um, uh, my... Yeah, the Syrian refugees. I know the Syrian have suffered a lot, and especially with recently with what happened with the earthquakes. So I don't know if you want to tell us about your experience. Have you experienced or have you visited any of the Syrian ref refugee camps? Uh, do you have any experience uh, with that topic? I mean, of the documentary that you're referring to, which is called City of Refuge, we went to northern Lebanon in a city called Tripoli. There are two Tripolis, or at least two that I'm aware of. Uh, yeah. In Libya, but there's one, of course, in northern Lebanon. Absolutely right, yeah. City to uh, Lebanon, and, and which um, at the time of the documentary, which was 2019, had um, a two thirds of the population were Syrians. So, um, in terms of kind of the proportions, they'd had obviously a of Syrian refugees because of the war and that had had a tremendous impact on um, the makeup of um, Tripoli's society if you like and we were there to um, explore how a city like Tripoli negotiates you know such significant mm -hmm. numbers when you consider for example that the UK says you know we can't we can't possibly take more than 3,000 Syrian refugees a year you know, uh, what does it look like when you're taking millions of refugees in? Um, and so we were also there to see kind of how Syrians themselves were managing as the war kind of was becoming more protracted and the prospect of returning to Syria was becoming um, one that more and more people were considering because although Syrians tended to be kind of almost like the more economically um, uh, well-off neighbours yeah. of, of their Lebanese counterparts and of course yeah. history, there's a lot of you know travel between the two the border was very fluid um, you know Syrians were becoming very impoverished and um, although we we obviously saw a huge amount of goodwill um, among the Lebanese 
the Lebanese themselves were struggling massively with huge issues of unemployment and any um, electricity cuts and um, things have only really deteriorated since we were there in 2019. Um, so I think, you know, maybe, maybe what I want to say about kind of Syrian refugees is that if you know the, the Middle East before the Syrian war, um, it's a little bit like if you knew Iraq before the Iraq war. And what I mean by that is that, you know, Iraqis had, you know, the highest number of female PhDs of the region and Syrians have always been, you know, some of the most highly educated with a, with a huge middle class, you know, there was a uh, a, a sort of wealth of industry and enterprise and um, if you wanted to study Arabic you know there was a time that Syria was where people would go Damascus was um, you know the city of dreams for so many and I think uh, uh, a real kind of lesson to be taken about the fragility of normality and we uh, I think a lot of people if you don't live, uh, you know, anywhere near somewhere that has experienced such drastic shifts, you think maybe they're not possible, you know, you think, oh, you know, London could never turn into, you know, a rubble city or, but when you see yeah. it happen to one city and then another, and sometimes entire countries in your lifetime, it seems to me that there's a very fragile balance in our lives that we really take for granted. And if anything's to learn from that, it's really that the situation that Syrian families, many of them now living in temporary camps, find themselves in is one that any of us in theory could find ourselves in. And um, I think there's something very kind of important to retain about remembering what Syria was and what it's become and realizing that that's not so um, far off. You know, I think there's many Syrians who could never have imagined um, yeah. you know, where they are today. I remember one of my friends in Morocco telling me about they have now got Syrian people begging in Morocco. And he said to me, you could not have uh, I, you could not have convinced me 15 years ago that it was possible that I would see Syrians begging in Morocco. He said to me, oh. if you said that to me, I would have said no way. Because oh. that just was so inconceivable. Um, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating to listen to that. Um, I don't know, Miriam, if you agree with me or not, but the women in, in, in Iraq, in Syria, Muslim women, they have, you know, with all respect, all women all over the world, but these one who went through like crises, wars, and and it was like a test for their uh, for their womanhood, if I can say, because they are extra special women. They are really, really, they have qualities. I don't think it's available in, in, in other women around the world because of the suffering they've been through. What do you comment on that? I mean, what make those uh, women extra special in your view? I mean, I, I think that like in general, the, you know, I, I don't really wanna sort of romanticize hardship in any way, but I think that hardship does tend to be something that either makes or breaks you and I think if if you can push through extreme hardship you tend to find diamonds um and so maybe that but I but I also kind of am cautious of of, of romanticizing you know what we're talking about which is you know you know genocidal practices and you know an ongoing extremely violent war and um, you know, a humanitarian crisis that, uh, you know, clearly deeply aggravated by the recent earthquakes. So, you know, yeah. I'm sort of cautious of, you know, that they're, they're people who need, who need support and assistance because actually ultimately uh, what happens to them could happen to any of us. And that's the bit where you would always hope that if it happened to you, someone else might step forward and 
provide yeah. and support. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, they are that type of women who are ready to, se to, to sacrifice their rights, their liberty, their freedom, even the money to support their families and to support their loved ones. So um, amazing, amazing examples that you've been talking about, uh, Miriam. Uh, my question, my next question is, if you don't mind telling me about Muslim women that you admired from the past and present. Mm. And you can tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the, I, the, there are lots, actually. Um, I think the, the, the ones that I would name historically, I would, I would obviously reference uh, Rabi, uh, Rabi al-Adawiya or Rabi al-Basri, as some people call her, um, who was uh, an 8th century Sufi mystic um, who had, uh, you know, who was uh, enslaved and then um, kind of uh, had such a, a huge talent. She was an amazing singer um, and uh, eventually decided that she wanted to dedicate her entire life to God and um, sort of forswore in a way something that I really relate to which is this idea of wanting to seek God neither for the pleasure of heaven nor for the fear of hell um you know that's something I personally really identify with I'm very suspicious of fear-based um attempts to cement belief you know I don't it doesn't speak yeah. to, neither really does the sort of slightly bizarre promises of some kind of you know um after um afterlife candy world you know i think there's something um uh, maybe necessary for for some people because different psyches operate differently but but for me neither of those um really work and so i i definitely feel a, a, an affinity to Rabia's um, view of the world in sort of saying that she she really just wanted to seek God's pleasure for the sake of that pleasure and nothing else. Um, That's interesting. Um, yes. so, so historically, her, I mean, obviously, Quranically, my namesake, there's a reason that I um, chose uh, Maryam Salam when I decided to choose um a name a muslim name um i think there's something obviously in the figure that transcends faith, you know any single faith it's a figure that we find across different faiths we also find in her a, a kind of powerful female um uh i i hesitate to say role model i would because i don't something about role model i find odd but but a, certainly a, a powerful female figure who highlights different facets of strength, you know, spiritual strength, literal physical strength in terms yeah. of what she goes through. Um, and then um, a sort of devotion uh, both to God and to her child, which I think are, um, are facets of femininity that are deeply abused by men a lot of the time but actually if they were respected um as they should be are uh really fragile and yet um forceful aspects of femininity amazing um so do you consider yourself to be a powerful woman Miriam a powerful woman yeah mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um i i don't i don't know that i've ever really thought about whether i'm a powerful woman um i'm i'm conscious of the fact that there is power that i do possess at, in how i move through the world and i try and be conscious of that power and how I exercise it um but I'm not someone who's driven by power so maybe it's just not something that I spend a huge amount of time thinking about no okay so have you ever been through an experience that made you realize that woman and power 
are not compatible together. Yeah. That women in power are not compatible? Are uh, not compatible ideas. Uh, well, I think they, they are absolutely compatible. Yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> we do have. It. Yes, okay. Please comment. How? Yes. How in what way? Um, in what way powerful? I mean, you can think of powerful through a whole range. You can yeah. think of militarily powerful women um you you know women who women rulers whether they're cited in the quran or kind of in subsequent periods of history we could think of um spiritually powerful women who have uh influenced uh you know the way that um you know men have learned about the faith or have uh you know affected the outcomes of um different spiritual sufi orders for example um and, and i think but but i i guess ultimately the the idea of is is i guess how you define power um and, and i and i and i do wonder whether uh a lot of the time we when we talk about power we are really caught up in a very masculine vision of power mm um power is exercised over others or power is force power is um aggression power is transgression i don't know i i don't know that power it, is it's what about the power of just uh, uh telling your opinion or doing what you believe in uh, to practice your rights that power uh that a woman i think should be able to have and to practice as well yeah I, I guess yeah it's it's just a terminology I guess I would probably lean more towards the notion of dignity and I think that there's a real power in dignity and dignity is kind of alignment with what you believe to be true and standing for those principles or taking towing a line or uh, you know, what we call standing in your power to me is alignment. It's alignment um, between your actions and your convictions. Um, so, yes, in that sense. Yeah. Thank you. One more question. We're going to take you back uh, to a, since you were a, a little girl. Um, uh, what was your dream? Uh, of becoming when you were little what what did you dream to become when you were when you were little oh um well I love horses and I love riding oh. and I always just wanted to be a show jumper and look after uh -huh. horses and maybe just be a vet I think those were like my earliest memories of what I wanted to do was something to do with animals and preferably to do with horses <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, that is interesting. Uh, Miriam, I know you are a mom uh, and you're bringing up uh, a child. Uh, I want to hear your views about bringing up uh, Muslim children uh, in the West. Um, it's positives, negatives, what are the challenges? And is it doable? Because nowadays uh, I've heard from so many Muslim moms saying, this country is not fit enough for us to, you know, to bring up our children in here. Uh, I'd rather take my children and go and, sell and live somewhere, you know, in a Muslim country. Uh, they started to have fears of challenges. So I want to hear your views about bringing up uh, Muslim children in the West, please. Well, so, I mean, I don't have a comparison of raising a child in a different context to this one. And I also, I'm from the West, you know, I'm French and I'm yeah. Irish and I, although I've lived in the Middle East, I have, um, you know, not really got a comparison beyond those experiences and I, I never raised my son in those contexts. Um, yeah. I think every context has its challenges. Um, yeah. my, main, my main concern, I think, with how a lot of the framing over raising children as Muslims in this context is that a lot of parents seem to be obsessed with wanting to avoid their children making mistakes 
that they themselves were allowed to make or that they allowed themselves to make. Everyone is on a journey, including your children. And I don't think the goal is to control your children. I'm very much of the school of Khalil Gibran's idea of you are a bow and your children are the arrows. And all you can really do is, you know, pull the back the bow and, and point it in the right direction. But once you let go of that arrow, and you do have to let go, um, that arrow will land where it has to land. And I think that you have to have a little bit more faith in your kids. Like, I think a lot of people are obsessed with kind of very narrow notions of purity and halal and haram in very narrow terms. The reality is that whether you're here or you're in a Muslim country, your kids are going to mess up just like you messed up. And they will probably find their way back as long as you didn't scare the crap out of them. Excuse my French, but like you just have to provide them, I think, a framework where Islam feels like a, a loving network of emotional guidance and support that Islam is something you desire to come back to, not something you feel like you need to run from um and I yeah that seems to be the main thing that I'm cautious of when I speak to some Muslim parents who say oh you know my kids are gonna go off the rails you know and I said well how were you doing when you were 15 tell me uh, fair enough <laughs> fair enough absolutely love that one great example <laughs> there so I uh, you agree with me it's, it's mainly about educating parents and they uh, they, they need to know that you know, what applies to their uh, past as children, uh, it is different. Nowadays, things are different and they just have to adapt and to be flexible about this. Uh, I'm going to move on now to uh, what's happening here uh, regarding Women's uh, International Week. I mean, uh, we have, I have to say, we have reached a really good uh, level of, you know, proving ourselves and uh, making us, ourselves to be heard. And then something rather bizarre and scary happens that knock our confidence. And I'm referring here to what happened with Sarah uh, Evard and uh, her murder by someone who was supposed to protect her. Where does that leave women after this? And I think there's more one example, but this is the one that stand out and it was like all over the country. It was a tragic incident to happen to a woman, really. So what do you comment on that? Um, so, so I think, you know, obviously we, we deal as women with a, uh, an omnipresent threat of violence, of male violence. And we have to be honest about that. You know, as a woman, I have to watch, you know, what I wear, where I go, who I speak to, where I put my drink, you know, the routes I take home at night. Much of my life, as is that of many women's, is dictated by trying to prevent male violence against me. And I think if you really acknowledge that, that's a very shocking reality. I don't think it's normal that we are existing as women in a world where, uh, you know, we are, if, if I walk down a street uh, at night and I cross a group of men, I'm scared. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that's a normal state of being. Um, and obviously what's um, particularly worrying or what was really upsetting to many uh, campaigners about, or to everyone really, about the Sarah Everard case is that the person who murdered her was somebody who was meant to be protecting her, you know, in this case, a police officer. And not just that, but a police officer who had made you know, several comments in WhatsApp groups about rape and had been kind of jokingly referred to as the rapist in his, by his colleagues. And there were all these sort of, what we would call red flags, I guess, about his behavior. And I think one of the big things that, you know, feminists have been saying for a long time is, 
you know, men need to hold other men accountable for their behavior. And that means if you're in a, a group or a social setting and you notice that one of your friends is being a bit lurchy or a bit, you know, making certain comments or, or appears to be making someone feel uncomfortable, it's not okay anymore just to sort of laugh along or ignore or just say, well, it's none of my business. You know, if you, if you see... Um, you know, I don't know, a man taking a, a woman out of a restaurant and she looks like she's intoxicated. I think you do, um, you know, have to have a different response to that as one of his friends these days than you would have maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I think things are changing in the expectations we have of um, men having to step up and confront um the so-called bad apples amongst them. And I think more broadly, more than just the bad apples, I think a climate of um, permissiveness with regards to misogynistic and in some cases, violent behavior. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I think uh, what, with time on, we need to leave some question. I've asked, I'm going to ask you the, the last question and then we can move on to a question from uh, attendants. Uh, my question is, with Ramadan coming around the corner, is there any messages that you would like to give to women? Uh, I know Women's International Week is on to Wednesday and Ramadan is coming up. So any messages for women or just in general? Over to you. Ooh, um, messages to women. I mean, look, I think oh, if, we, if we're here to talk about gender equity um, in the context <laughs> of Ramadan, let's talk about who does all the cooking and who does <laughs> and who gets to go to the who gets to stay at home and do the cleanup and stay with the kids and you know let's talk about it because you know my experience is that it's a very female dominated group who are the ones that do all of the labor and that you know there's all these men who think they're so spiritual for attending tarawih every night but don't bother to help with their household or their you know family or the child care or the cooking and the cleaning and you know I'm personally a big believer that actually you know God is looking at that stuff just as much as he is how many times you attended Tarawih prayers in person so yeah absolutely I like that one absolutely uh, so uh, again I think women should know and should realize as well that it's not the kitchen is not just theirs they need to look after themselves and, 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 you know, just treat themselves the way they deserve, really. So uh, that is amazing. Thank you so much, Miriam. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. You know, we talked about different topics. I wish we had more time to, to talk about, uh, about these in details. Uh, so that was uh, uh, Monira with you. And now we're going to move to see if we have questions from uh, the panels, if you don't mind. Is there I, any questions? Um, I can read one out for question, you. Please. Yes, please. So there's one in the chat. It says, are you aware of any grassroots organization in France bringing awareness around tolerance, multinational, interfaith and gender issues? Did you get that, um, Marie? Yeah. I mean, FEMISO would be my recommendation to look at what FEMISO do, and then you can probably find a lot of organizations through them. F-E-M-Y-S-O. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's another one from Hajra. She says, I wanted to ask Dr. Mariam how she found her directorial debut. What was the creative process like? What did she learn from the process? Ooh, so she's talking about Al Jazeera, probably, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, well, no, so that would be my documentary, I think. I mean, look, I, I, the, it was extremely grueling, extreme. It's probably, it, it's by far one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It was, um, 
it was and remains an emotionally uh, complex um, film to negotiate. And um, I creatively knew that I didn't really want to uh, make a standard documentary like those I've often made in current affairs, which is much more about sort of a very standard way of, of filmmaking. I wanted to make something that was actually a film, that something that had symbolism and, you know, beauty and um, that spoke to your heart in kind of more of an allegorical way. And I have to say that when I began this process, I didn't even know how to use a camera. So I literally taught myself how to film. Um, this film is, you know, 80% self shot by me. Um, that was unbelievably difficult, unbelievably difficult. And I made a ton of mistakes, but all I can really say is like, if you allow the things you can't do to stop you from doing the things you want to do, um, you, you will sit around waiting. And I think sometimes you just have to grab the ball by the horns and, and just go for it. And there were a ton of people just saying to me, well, this is ridiculous. You don't know how to shoot. How are you going to even do this? And I was like, I know it's ridiculous. And yeah, here I am. So it can be done. You can learn a lot from YouTube. All right. There's a question here. It said, if you have, if you have political power, what I, do things you would change? Political oh, power. Oh, wow. If I had political power, we would live in a very different world. <laughs> um, I, I believe in the prioritization of people over profits. I believe in a human-centered society. I believe in an economic people that serves balance and um, space for people to be creative and for community and ultimately for love in different manifestations to exist. And that involves um, wrestling back time from the machine that has been created that has made us all kind of cogs in service to productivity. And that is not why we were created. That is not why we are here. And another way is possible, power to the people. Fascinating, thank you. Do we have more questions from the... Yes, we do. Uh, There's one in the chat, a long one. Uh, can I share that one? It's from Yaya Bird, I think. Mm -hmm. And there's one more. Let me get to the bottom. He sends salam, dear Mariam. He says, I hope you're well. What do you think is driving Muslim insulism? And what can Muslim men do to most effectively combat it? And secondly, what should we done about the attraction of far-right misogynist white men to Islam? misconstrued as a mirror of their prejudices many religious leaders seem to be cheering them on yes so that's yeah, your word well, yes, yeah. thank you for that question which by the way was on my mind when we were talking about a few other things which obviously is the way in which uh you know figures like andrew tate end up being idealized in our community um look i think that there are uh, what what people like that, what incels in general tap into, right, are men who feel diminished, frustrated, um, uh, looked down upon, who feel that they are not respected, and unfortunately, who are sold the idea that they can acquire that uh, sense of dignity through uh, a hierarchical. Um, and, and hierarchical is the nicest way I could put it, but I want to say like a, a kind of brutally hierarchical uh, imposition of their will upon others. You know, I am strong because I can trample on them uh, and them often being women or men that you perceive to be weaker. And I, and I, and I feel deeply that that, that is so fundamentally antithetical to how I see Islam, because I really believe that you know, 
so much of what the Prophet taught us about strength is about, you know, killing your ego and about learning to control yourself. And, you know, the really powerful man isn't the one who wields a sword. He's the one who controls his anger. And um, and so much of the masculinity that I feel is evidenced in the uh, person of the Prophet is about um, kindness and compassion and empathy and um, softness, ultimately. And so it's really perplexing in some ways, but in others, I think that the appeal of these groups is testament to the disrespect that, that um, you know, men of color in general experience in our societies and Muslim men in particular I think obviously have experienced the brunt of you know the kind of intersection of racism and Islamophobia and I think that the solution to um, a kind of very angry and brutal masculinity is um, sort of softly, soft, but kind of very powerfully anchored men who are very confident in who they are as men, as in, I, I don't think that um, that sort of betrays anything like assertiveness or um, confidence or, um, you know, any of the traits that these guys sort of think that they have a monopoly on. I think it, it's about showing them a, a vision of masculinity that is deeply powerful but that is anchored in so much more something so much more compassionate and um I think there is real space for that I don't really see many Muslim men offering it but there are some um there are some I think working in that direction um I think particularly among black Muslims I would say that there are quite a few people that I would refer to um, who, uh, you know, Mustafa Briggs does great work on this. Um, I'm also thinking of um, the guy who does the the Malcolm podcast, like his name escapes me right now, but I think there's like a an assertive and yet kind, compassionate masculinity that I see reflected there that, you know, wouldn't just benefit us in the narrow sense, but could probably be quite a useful counter to this notion that you're either kind of patriarchal and assertive and dominant or you're a weak man and it's like no there's like a kind of centered power that is softly spoken and yet very anchored that is very desirable if that's what you were wondering about gents Absolutely, I do agree with you. It's again, it's one of those challenges that you know uh, the younger generation are facing, and it's like a talking point for them in school. So we have to be aware of it, like parents and people like who can influence, you know, those young people. That is really, really interesting question. Do we have time for more questions at all? Um, yes, we do have time. There's one question in the chat. It says. I admired Margaret Thatcher and Ang Angela Merkel when they were in government. <laughs> Do we have an equivalent woman in the Muslim world of today that you admire, Mariam? <laughs> that was uh, I mean, when you say equivalent, I think you're obviously listing women who are in, uh, you know, positions of senior political leadership. I would say that I have huge, you know, in general, my role models tend to be uh, what I would call countercultural figures. So I'm sort of less likely to be looking at, um, I don't know, a, uh, although I think Angela Merkel is a very, of all the kind of leaders you were gonna pick, probably the least worst example, but I just don't tend to look at those in the positions of senior authority like that. I'm more likely to look at like an Angela Davis figure or somebody who's sort of more countercultural. Um, and in the Muslim world, if you were uh, going to ask me uh, someone who I really deeply admire, I mean, um, she uh, is a young Palestinian uh, woman who has just written uh, her autobiography, I believe, with uh, Dina Takruri, I think, who wrote it with her. Um, I, her name escapes me right now. I think it's is it Amel? Somebody can correct me. Um, but she's basically one of the sort of 
leading figures in the Palestinian uh, resistance. Uh, and I think that she encapsulates the next generation of young Palestinians who will continue to advocate for uh, their civil rights, for uh, anti-racism, for anti-apartheid, um, and for a future in which there is no hierarchy of human value in any society. Absolutely. And I, being a Palestinian myself, Miriam, I totally agree with that. And we have so many examples. Maybe we don't know the names, but there are, you know, live examples. They're showing a great, great um, uh, examples of women, you know, fighting for their rights and not just for their, for their countries and for their families as well. Amazing. Absolutely. It was uh, a pleasure to you and, uh, and you know, the information that you gave us and the way you think about things, it was fascinating. I hope uh, our uh, guests enjoyed that as well. So I think we nearly, we've got five minutes left. Do, do we need any more questions, Kisra, at all? Or I think we're done. I've kept one for myself at the end, okay? So this is for Maria for her writing life, really. Um, tell us a little bit about your writing life, for example, what project are you working on at the moment, what sort of research, and any writing routines, for example, these days, I'm very, very busy, and the only time I would get is at night time. What is it like for you at the moment? Um, you know, I'm kind of on a bit of a writing fast at the moment. I've been so caught up with my film and with other work that I haven't really had the space um, in, to dedicate to writing, um, but I miss it deeply. You know, I was doing a panel over the weekend and um, it struck me that I have so many things I really want to say and I hope to God that I get the opportunity to put them out there. But, um, you know, writers, a writer's life is a struggle, is a struggling life. You know, there were other writers on the panel who were saying, you know, very few writers can actually live off of their writing. And uh, I would echo that right now in saying that, you know, um, unfortunately, the same way that capitalism has kind of squeezed our space for imagination, which, by the way, is one form of resistance to the current situation in which we find ourselves, you know, and I mean, the state of this country, the UK, but the state of the world more broadly, which requires a deep reimagination of an alternative way of being in this world. And we are, are squeezed so deeply by the machine that that space artistically, theoretically, has been almost vanquished. If you're a creative, you have to produce entertainment, more Love Island, more stuff that's going to get ratings. Or if you're a writer, you know, you've got to get sell, you know, all these books and all people really want to read these days are kind of, you know, short sort of either very snappy self-help books or, um, you know, what, what actually are people reading these days in a, a, any, any length and who has the time to dedicate to writing because a lot of academics don't, most writers I know are sort of, you know, on the breadline actually. So it's just one to throw out there. I think for anyone who really believes in the need for creatives uh, you know, one thing our community has been really terrible at has been supporting creatives. And I think we need way more uh, funds to uh, allocated to support, you know, um, creatives of all varieties to allow them to resource in the richness of our faith in order to be able to deploy that arsenal in a way that is helpful and meaningful to wider culture. And none of us can do that when we're just trying to stay afloat. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Miriam. There's a comment from a lady from the guest and uh, correcting the Palestinian writer. Yep, Tanya. Is that correct? Thank you so yeah, much. Mary Thank you. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to finish off uh, this lovely, enjoyable talk. It was a pleasure to have you. So thank you so much, Dr. Marion Francois, for your time and for your lovely input for this uh, meeting. Thank you very much, Kestra, and thank you very much, Macfest. And we hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much.